worked in Saskatchewan for many years doing my own research for my graduate work, but my first experience visiting an organic farm as a researcher was uh, Ian Cushion, Ian and Joanne's farm uh, in Oxbow. And I was really impressed that Ian rode a bicycle around the farm. And uh, so I have that bicycle at our farm and research center because I want to be just like Ian. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some theory, first of all. And you all have this in front of you. This is, uh, this, uh, is actually a, a systems thinking model which uh, was published in 1963 by Weinberg in a textbook called An Introduction to Systems Thinking. And I bought this textbook when the late Dean Fond and I were visiting Purdue University, and I, I love bookstores, and I went through the uh, used book section, I found this book, and it really has helped uh, my, my teaching. And some of my former students here actually studied this model. They can put up their hands. Did any students study this model? Okay, a few of them, they're shy. They forgot. Uh, okay, so let me explain this to you because I think it's useful. Uh, on the x y axis here, we have randomness. So as you go up, um, things become less predictable, more random. You know, that's not a good situation. And uh, on the x axis, we have complexity. So very little complexity, a lot of complexity. Um, this is life, right? Because life is random, there's random events, uh, and, and things and systems can be very complex. So what, what Weinberg did is he broke this model up into three sections. And uh, you may want to pull out a pen and jot down a few notes on your paper uh, while we're going to see, you know, sort of how your farming system sort of fits into the Weinberg model. And uh, so what Weinberg has in the bottom left-hand corner, things are not very random and not very complex. Th th those, those things in there are pretty predictable, and, and he calls that really the toolbox, okay? For all intents and purposes, we could call that the toolbox, organized simplicity. Things now, are pretty simple. Now, Martin, uh, I just want to interject here. How would we measure um, success or failure, or how would we measure results within that box? Okay, that's a good question. Um, let's say in a, in a conventional farm, you added nitrogen fertilizer. That nitrogen fertilizer is really in the toolbox. You yep. would measure its response by mathematically what sort of a response curve. Or in the case of new varieties, you would measure how they compare to a standard. So we'd use sort of those traditional statistics. Yep. You'd bore you with. Numbers and statistics. Numbers and statistics. That's what right. you use to measure. Yeah. Okay, that's the answer he wanted. Yeah. He's been a very patient teacher. Okay, so in organic farms, uh, machines, new crop varieties, things that are fairly predictable. You know that if the battery is charged and there's fuel in your tractor, you turn the key, even if it's a fairly complicated machine, it's probably going to start and go boom. <clears throat> okay, so that's fairly simple. Um, up at the top, uh, Weinberg has an area which is very random, and in our life in agriculture, we know this part of the world very well. Weather is an example of something that is highly random and very difficult for us to know what it's going to do from day to day. Uh, markets uh, can be very random. Sometimes we have markets, sometimes they go up and down. As a farmer, we don't have a lot of control of that. And for conventional agriculture, one of the other processes I like to remind people of is evolution. Evolution uh, causes herbicide-resistant weeds. So how would you measure something in that section? Let's see if I can get it right the first time this time. <clears throat> you would use probability analysis, like the probability of precipitation tomorrow is 70%. Exactly. Good answer, Martin. Okay. I got 60% on my midterm. Uh, and I have to study harder for the final. I hate that. I hate when that happens. Um, okay, and then in the middle, you have this zone. This is, this is where farmers live. That's the long and the short of this. This, is, this zone is called organized complexity, according to the Weinberg model. And it's the zone of systems. Um, farming systems, cropping systems. And this, this is where you, as, as farmers, live. Now, in order, like, I appreciate research that's 
done on components, like how much nitrogen do you need to grow a crop of wheat, um, things like that. But in organic systems, I think we should be more holistic and we should measure the entire farm. We should measure the system. But how the heck do you measure a system? It's not easy. You can't use numbers. That's down in the bottom corner. You can't use probability, or you probably shouldn't because it's not very helpful. So how do you measure a system? Do you have any ideas? That's a very good question, Professor Martins. Let me see if I can get my midterm mark up to like 75% so I can at least party before Christmas exams. Um, I, I think one, one answer I would put down is we would measure the direction our farm is going, whether it's going up in terms of improving soil, weeds not being too bad of a problem, or whether it's going down, we can't grow good crops, our soil is unhealthy and doesn't smell good. How did I do? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's perfect. It, you can measure, you have an intuitive feeling, is, are things getting better or are they getting worse? If they're getting better, everything's good with the world. If they're getting worse, then we've got to talk about a new model, which you're going to introduce us to, I think. Right. Um, by the way, I just wanted to show by these pictures that it's in this zone here, the zone, remember, called organized complexity, where farmers live. It's, it's complex, but it's organized. So you are systems managers as farmers. Uh, I have a picture in my organic course notes of somebody uh, running the operations room, running, you know, launching the space shuttle. That's a rocket scientist, right? And a farmer. And they are, because they're actually dealing with more complex systems. They're both smart in different ways. But that's where farmers live, right in the middle. And so to to make progress, you know, the, the reality of farming is we, we have to, we are subject to events which we have no control over. Uh, we may be able to predict the probability of the price of organic wheat in two years, but we don't know that for sure. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, you do? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and we don't know, uh, you know, and, and, and so that's what we're subject to, and we have tools in our toolbox which we can use to design that system. So, any questions about the Weinberg model? You got it? Okay. So let's, let's move on. Um, this arrow shows a particular direction. Now the arrow is going down and it may imply to you, oh, that's a bad thing. We're going from, you know, from bad to worse. But that's actually not what this arrow is supposed to be showing. What it, this arrow is supposed to be showing, and you've already figured it out, that to decrease randomness, or in other words, to increase resilience, we must increase system diversity and ecological complexity. Okay? So, does that make sense to you? Put up your hand if it makes sense to you. Okay, great. So, that is really, when we're talking about cropping systems, what we teach our students is... How do, how do we create a more stable, resilient system? We have to make it diverse and complex. Uh, so, that, so, Martin, did, did you come up with that? That, that? that line? No, yeah, this, these words here. These words? Yeah, I... See, yeah. There, there are people writing this down, so that means someday in the future, this is going to be a quotation that shows up. Now, you should put Dr. Martin Enns at the bottom no, of that. No, don't do that. No, don't do that, because... Um, Why? You because I probably have a spelling mistake. You don't believe it? The phonics is... I believe it. Okay, right okay. The well, then let's move okay, on. Okay, uh, let's move on. Shut, shut the front door. He's telling me. That's what he's telling me. Um, okay, so you got a weak fallow system. Um, and it's, it's, it's up there. It's, it's quite random. It's, it's a very simple system. Um, it, it suffers from, you know, from lack of complexity. Um... Okay, so you all saw that. Wheat fallow system, uh, of course, we need to improve on this. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little story which I found really interesting, which is based on research that was just published uh, in Canada. This comes from uh, colleagues, uh, Miriam's colleagues at the uh, Swift Current Agriculture Canada Research Centre, um, where the scientists surveyed 
uh, a lot of organic fields and conventional fields and looked at the mycorrhiza, you know, the little beneficial fungi in the soil. And, um, and, and uh, they actually came up with some quite useful conclusions, a little bit uh, depressing, but useful. And, and it's in this quote here. They basically said that insufficient carbon in organic wheat may be unable to just adjust to the carbon demand of the, the, the mycorrhiza. Now, you know, there's typically more mycorrhizal fungi in organic soils versus conventional soils. Not always, but usually. And this picture here is from our Glenlee rotation, uh, where uh, one of the students separated out the mycorrhizal spores from the conventional and organic fields, 100 grams of each soil. And that, that shows you that the organic land has more mycorrhiza. And those mycorrhiza have to eat. And so what these researchers concluded is that if you have a bad rotation with not enough carbon going into your soil, when you seed a crop into that land, uh, the mycorrhiza are going to want all the food and there's not going to be enough for your crop. That's a, that's a, I think that's a very useful observation to make, that it's telling us that our crops might be carbon limited. Now, and we've never thought of that. I don't know, do you ever teach carbon limitations to your students? I, I don't. Nope, I haven't thought of it that way yeah. before. And so this, this makes me think of a term that I hear more about now, and that's carbon fertilization of soils. Um, so uh, what the researchers in the paper said that here's a couple of ways of dealing with this. You could reduce the number of mycorrhiza. Well, I think we've been told for years we shouldn't do that. We should no, increase them. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, so Gary's saying no. Or we could increase early soil moisture to grow a better plant to make more carbon. Not in the Red River Valley. Okay, not in the Red River Valley, but maybe in the dryland areas. Increase early available nitrogen to make a crop healthier and, and be able to fix more carbon. Okay. Yeah, Gary okay. sold. Or improve the inherent CO2 assimilation or carbon dioxide assimilation or capture of the wheat, which probably these increasing moisture and nitrogen would do. So, so th th this is one of the this is a, a terrific piece of information coming out of uh, the the prairies uh, based on, in, in Saskatchewan, and so. Uh, what do we do? How do we design a system that's going to put more carbon into the soil that's going to be able to satisfy the appetite of the mycorrhiza and satisfy the appetite of growing a, a high-yielding wheat crop? Uh, there are many different ways and all the things that they suggested except reducing um, mycorrhiza are probably a good idea. So, I mean, the obvious thing here is to put a plow down crop into that wheat fallow rotation. Okay, so that, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot of different species to choose from. Uh, there's, you know, if we look at dry areas, there's, there's lentil, there's chickling vetch, there's peas grow well in dry areas, there's all kinds of species. If you go to wet areas, uh, there's faba beans, you can use soybeans, you can use peas, you can use many different species. Um, here's one that's very popular where we live, uh, forage peas and maybe a few oats, very widely adapted, also grows pretty well in wet areas. Um, have you ever grown a crop like this and it hasn't done well under wet conditions, Gary? Well, to be honest with you, I'm just starting to farm and uh, I did this this summer and uh, grazed it down. Okay. And I had a really good crop of it, yeah. How did it taste? <laughs> oh, you had animals? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, actually, I did eat some of that. Yeah, it's yeah, good. It's good. It's tasty. Yeah. The flowers are tasty, and we learned from the chef this morning that this is good. We're just once again ahead of our time, Gary. <laughs> okay, um, this is a farmer that came to our Glenley Field Day, and look at how happy that. That's a smile, just in case you know. And that farmer is, is blade rolling our faba beans. So when it's wet, faba beans grow really well, and uh, um, <clears throat> so there's. Uh, you know, and, and, and so we started actually, you know, we said we want to increase the nitrogen to crops, we also want to conserve water. So going with this, this blade rolling system can actually conserve water uh, in the green manure phase. And this is just to remind ourselves that, you know, blade rolling should be done after something flowers. What's a blade roller? Blade roller. Gary will talk. A blade roller is uh, that machine that you can't see there behind the tractor. 
it's an, a knife roller. It's an attempt to do reduced tillage, and uh, Dr. Fernandez just told us we shouldn't do that. So I'm going to address that yeah, a little Gary's, bit later. Gary's going to address that and lift the stand. Okay. Uh, Harry Vetch, this is uh, probably uh, one of the best nitrogen fixers. Gary will show you how this is used in a no-till system, an organic no-till system. Uh, when we spring plant Harry Vetch, uh, it produces a lot of biomass. And you can see by our poster there, you should pick up one of the handouts from our poster, give you a bit more information. But it'll fix 160 pounds of nitrogen quite easily. And uh, um, it, it has lots of potential. Uh, uh, we've also, you know, there's also, uh, you hear of things like cowpea and lab lab. There's tropical legumes if you're seeding your cover crop in, in August, let's say. Uh, you know, these, these things are beginning to achieve, uh, receive some research attention, although seed supplies right now are limited. Uh, and then, you know, there's opportunities to grow mixtures, and this is what we do, what we have done a lot at our Glenley plots, is have peas, soybean, and faba bean, and a little bit of oat. So, if it's wet, the faba beans, the soybean do well, and if it's dry, the peas do well. So, But uh, remember, what we're trying to achieve here is, uh, we're trying to achieve adding more carbon into the soil, adding nitrogen to have that wheat crop be healthy so that when it grows, it can suck in a lot of CO2, a lot of carbon dioxide, and feed itself and the mycorrhiza. Because of course, the mycorrhiza are fed by the carbon coming into the plant, going through the roots and, uh, and leaching into the, uh, into the soil or uh, connecting right into the, the mycorrhiza. We, we are in a 20-inch rain area, 500 millimeters. Yeah, that's the problem with inviting us here, because we, we come from a different place. Um. So you're probably intelligent enough to take what we have and interpret it for your own farm, right? Cut it in half. Cut it in half. You know, that's, that, that's, our, that's our chickling batch. So, you know, and, and, yeah, okay, you got it. Okay. <laughs> now, okay, uh, so, so the plow down, it, the, the point here was, you know, to show that the point here is there is a plow down species for every, every weather condition. And we've done work in Saskatchewan, we've grown hairy vetch in Saskatchewan, we've grown peas, we've grown other crops. So we also do some of our work in different places. And uh, we also do a little bit of work in Southern Africa in very 